Section nine of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter seventeen. The next day Ernest wrote a letter of more or less superficial tenderness to Ethel. She had wounded his pride by proving victorious in the end over his passion and hers. Besides, he was in the throes of work. When after the third day no answer came, he was inclined to feel aggrieved. It was plain now that she had not cared for him in the least, but had simply played with him for lack of another toy. A flush of shame rose to his cheeks at the thought. He began to analyze his own emotions, and stunned, if not stabbed, his passion step by step. Work was calling to him. It was that which gave life its meaning, not the love of a season. How far away, how unreal she now seemed to him! Yes, she was right, he had not cared deeply, and his novel, too, would be written only at her. It was the heroine of his story that absorbed his interest, not the living prototype. Once in a conversation with Reginald he touched upon the subject. Reginald held that modern taste no longer permitted even the photographer to portray life as it is, but insisted upon an individual visualization. No man, he remarked, was ever translated bodily into fiction. In contradiction to life, art is a process of artificial selection. Bearing in mind this motive, Ernest went to work to mould from the material in hand a new Ethel, more real than life. Unfortunately he found little time to devote to his novel. It was only when, after a good day's work, a pile of copy for a magazine lay on his desk that he could think of concentrating his mind upon Leontina. The result was that when he went to bed his imagination was busy with the plan of his book, and the creatures of his own brain laid their fingers on his eyelid so that he could not sleep. When at last sheer weariness overcame him, his mind was still at work, not in orderly sequence, but along trails monstrous and grotesque. Hobgoblins seemed to steal through the hall, and leering incubi oppressed his soul with terrible burdens. In the morning he awoke unrested. The tan vanished from his face, and little lines appeared in the corners of his mouth. It was as if his nervous vitality were sapped from him in some unaccountable way. He became excited, hysterical. Often at night, when he wrote his pot-boilers for the magazines, fear stood behind his seat, and only the buzzing of the elevator outside brought him back to himself. In one of his morbid moods he wrote a sonnet which he showed to Reginald after the latter's return from a short trip out of town. Reginald read it, looking at the boy with a curious, lurking expression. O oh, gentle sleep, turn not thy face away, but place thy finger on my brow, and take all burdens from me and all dreams that ache. Upon mine eyes a cooling balsam lay, seeing I am a weary of the day. But lo, thy lips are ashen, and they quake. What spectral vision sees thou that can shake thy sweet composure and thy heart dismay? Perhaps some murderer's cruel eye a gleam is fixed upon me, or some monstrous dream might bring such fearful guilt upon the head of my unvigilant soul, as would arouse the Borgian snake from her envenomed bed, or startle Nero in his golden house. "'Good stuff,' Reginald remarked, laying down the manuscript. "'When did you write it?' "'The night when you were out of town,' Ernest rejoined. "'I see,' Reginald replied. There was something startling in his intonation that at once aroused Ernest's attention. "'What do you see?' he asked quickly. "'Nothing,' Reginald replied, with immovable calm. "'Only that your state of nerves is still far from satisfactory.' Chapter 18 After Ernest's departure, Ethel Brandenburg's heart was swaying hither and thither in a hurricane of conflicting feelings. Before she had time to gain an emotional equilibrium, his letter had hurled her back into chaos. A false ring somewhere in Ernest's words, re-echoing with an ever-increasing volume of sound, stifled the voice of love. His jewelled sentences glittered, but left her cold. They lacked that spontaneity which renders even simple and hackneyed phrases wonderful and unique. Ethel clearly realized that her hold upon the boy's imagination had been a fleeting midsummer night's charm, and that a word from Reginald's lips had broken the potency of her spell. She almost saw the shadow of Reginald's visage hovering over Ernest's letter and leering at her from between the lines in sinister triumph. 
Finally reason came and whispered to her that it was extremely unwise to give her heart into the keeping of the boy. His love, she knew, would have been exacting, irritating at times. He would have asked her to sympathize with every phase of his life, and would have expected active interest on her part in much that she had done with long ago. Thus untruth would have stolen into her life and embittered it. When mates are unequal, love must paint its cheeks, and in certain moods at least hide its face under a mask. Its lips may be honeyed, but it brings fret and sorrow in its train. These things she told herself over and over again while she penned a cool and calculating answer to Ernest's letter. She rewrote it many times, and every time it became more difficult to reply. At last she put her letter aside for a few days, and when it fell again into her hand it seemed so unnatural and strained that she destroyed it. Thus several weeks had passed, and Ernest no longer exclusively occupied her mind, when one day in early September, while glancing over a magazine, she came upon his name in the table of contents. Once more she saw the boy's wistful face before her, and a trembling something stirred in her heart. Her hand shook as she cut the pages, and a mist of tears clouded her vision as she attempted to read his poem. It was a piece of sombre brilliance. Like black-draped monks half-crazed with mystic devotion, the poet's thoughts flitted across the page. It was the wail of a soul that feels reason slipping from it, and beholds madness rise over its life like a great pale moon. A strange unrest emanated from it and took possession of her. And again, with an insight that was prophetic, she distinctly recognized behind the vague fear that had haunted the poet the figure of Reginald Clark. A half-forgotten dream, struggling to consciousness, staggered her by its vividness. She saw Clark as she had seen him in days gone by, grotesquely transformed into a slimy sea-thing, whose hungry mouth shut sucking upon her, and whose thousand tentacles encircled her form. She closed her eyes in horror at the reminiscence. And in that moment it became clear to her that she must take into her hands the salvation of Ernest Fielding from the clutches of the malign power that had mysteriously enveloped his life. CHAPTER Nineteen. The summer was brief, and already by the middle of September many had returned to the pleasures of urban life. Ethel was among the first comers, for after her resolve to enter the life of the young poet, once more, it would have been impossible for her to stay away from the city much longer. Her plan was all ready. Before attempting to see Ernest she would go to meet Reginald and implore him to free the boy from his hideous spell. An element of curiosity unconsciously entered her determination. When, years ago, she and Clark had parted, the man had seemed for once greatly disturbed, and had promised, in his agitation, that some day he would communicate to her what would exonerate him in her eyes. She had answered that all words between them were purposeless, and that she hoped never to see his face again. The experience that the years had brought to her, instead of elucidating the mystery of Reginald's personality, had, on the contrary, made his behaviour appear more and more unaccountable. She had more than once caught herself wishing to meet him again, and to analyse dispassionately the puzzling influences he had exerted upon her. And she could at last view him dispassionately. There was triumph in that. She was dimly aware that something had passed from her, something by which he had held her, and without which his magnetism was unable to play upon her. So when Wacom sent her an invitation to one of his artistic at-homes, she accepted, in the hope of meeting Reginald. It was his frequentation of Wacom's house that had for several years effectively barred her foot from crossing the threshold. It was with a very strange feeling that she greeted the many familiar faces at Wacom's now, and when, toward ten o'clock, Reginald entered, politely bowing in answer to the welcome from all sides, her heart beat in her like a drum. But she calmed herself, and catching his eye so arranged it that early in the evening they met in an alcove of the drawing-room. "'It was inevitable,' Reginald said. I expected it." "'Yes,' she replied. "'We were bound to meet.' Like a great rush of water, memory came back to her. He was still horribly fascinating as of old, only she was no longer susceptible to his fascination. He had changed somewhat in those years. The lines about his mouth had grown harder, and a steel-like look had come into his eyes. Only for a moment, as he looked at her, a flash of tenderness seemed to come back to them. Then he said, with a touch of sadness, "'Why should the first word between us be a lie?' Ethel made no answer. Reginald looked at her half in wonder, and said, "'And is your love for the boy so great that it overcame your hate of me?' "'Ah, he knew,' she winced. "'He has told you.' 
Not a word. There was something superhuman in his power of penetration. Why should she wear a mask before him, when his eyes, like the eyes of God, pierced to the core of her being? No, she replied, it is not love, but compassion for him. Compassion? Yes, compassion for your victim. You mean— Reginald. I am all ear. I implore you. Speak. You have ruined one life. He raised his eyebrows derogatively. Yes, she continued fiercely, ruined it. Is not that enough? I have never willfully ruined any one's life. You have ruined mine. Willfully? How else shall I explain your conduct? I warned you. Warning, indeed, the warning that the snake gives to the sparrow helpless under its gaze. Ah, but who tells you that the snake is to blame? Is it not rather the occult power that prescribes with blood on brazen scroll the law of our being? This is no solace to the sparrow. But whatever may be said, let us drop the past. Let us consider the present. I beg of you, leave this boy, let him develop without your attempting to stifle the life in him, or impressing upon it the stamp of your alien mind. Ethel, he protested, you are unjust. If you knew— then an idea seemed to take hold of him. He looked at her curiously. "'What if I knew?' she asked. "'You shall know,' he said simply. "'Are you strong?' "'Strong to withstand anything at your hand. There is nothing that you can give me, nothing that you can take away.' "'No,' he remarked. "'Nothing.' "'Yes, you have changed. Still, when I look upon you, the ghosts of the past seem to rise like live things.' We both have changed. We now meet upon equal grounds. You are no longer the idol I made of you. Don't you think that to the idol this might be a relief, not a humiliation? It is a terrible torture to sit in state with lips eternally shut. Sometimes there comes over the most reticent of us a desire to break through the eternal loneliness that surrounds the soul. It is this feeling that prompts madmen to tear off their clothes and exhibit their nakedness in the marketplace. It's madness on my part or a whim, or I don't know what, but it pleases me that you should know the truth. You promised me long ago that I should. Today I will redeem my promise, and I will tell you another thing that you will find hard to believe. And that is? That I loved you. Ethel smiled a little skeptically. You have loved often. No, he replied. Loved, seriously loved. I have only once. End of section nine.